So when we collect our data, we need to present it in a way that is understandable to the average person looking at our experiment. So if we just gave them a bunch of data points that we've been taking all put together in no certain order, it wouldn't really make a lot of sense. So in order for it to make sense so that people are interested in what we're researching, just like we should be, then we need to make it organized. We need to make it easily accessible. And one way that we can do that is through the use of data tables. So data tables simply just organize anything that we recorded in our experiment. So this is an organized method, an organized method for our data. So whenever we have our data, we need to specify our variables, our independent, dependent, and control. When we're putting our variables into data tables, we do have a certain setup that we go by. So data tables can be written from this T data table. And if you're working with a D, or sorry, T data table, on the left side, you are going to put your independent variable. So your independent variable, or the one you're changing on purpose, will always go on the left side of your data table. On the right side of your data table, you will put your dependent variable. So the one that is responding to you changing something in your experiment. Now, sometimes our data tables are upright like this, and then sometimes they are stacked on top of each other like this, where our independent goes on top and our dependent goes on bottom. And we just put whatever data we have after that. So if we did one, two, three, and got a reading of two, four, six, that's how we would write it in our data table here, or our T-shaped. And then if it's side by side here, we would just do one, two, three, two, four, six. So it's an easy way to see um, when I changed a certain independent variable, this is the response we got from our dependent variable. Another thing to point out is that as I'm making these data tables, I need to make sure I include units in these. So whatever I am taking measurement of, whether that is by meters or grams or liters, I need to state exactly what I'm working with. Otherwise, I just have a bunch of random numbers. So for instance, if my independent variable is being measured in grams, I would put next to my independent variable up here on the top, I would put a G for grams so that everyone knows underneath that independent variable, I am dealing with one gram two gram, three gram, and it's not questioned exactly what I'm measuring. Same thing with dependent variable. So if I was measuring in grams with my independent variable, and then I measured in length with my dependent, maybe I use meters, I would go ahead and put meters up at the top near my dependent variable. With every input of my independent variable, I get an output of my dependent variable. This is because data, data is collected in ordered pairs. Data is collected in ordered pairs. So what that means is for every input, every number I have for my independent should have a number in my dependent variable that goes with it. This is an ordered pair. So my ordered pair here would be one and two. That would be our ordered pairs. And so that really helps us when we start to deal with graphs. So in order to show those trends, to start seeing this in an even clearer picture, we can use a certain type of graph called a line graph. Line graphs are really, really good at showing trends in our data. The one place you may have seen line graphs very recently would be if you have looked at any weather showing a trend over time, maybe in the amount of precipitation or rain that has happened in your town, or if it's particularly hot for a bunch of days or particularly cold for a bunch of days. Oftentimes that's when we get to see line graphs. 
Line graphs can be shown in any situation, though, when we are experimenting, if we want to just show a trend. So that is their main importance is to show trends in data. Through these trends, the more we have, they can actually eventually help us make predictions. So line graphs are also very good at helping us make predictions. So again, if I'm looking at that weather report, if I'm looking at that weather data, I could predict what is going to happen maybe next week. If I had a bunch of hot weather this week, I can predict that maybe I'm going to have a bunch of hot weather next week. Or even farther out, I know that if it's really hot in the month of July next year, it probably will also be really hot in the month of July. So it just helps us to make those predictions over time. So every time we make a line graph, we have a specific order we have to put our variables in. So our line graphs go on one quadrant here. That's why I have gone and drawn a vertical and horizontal line. My two variables that I'm going to be plotting are the same ones that were in my data table, my independent and my dependent variable. My independent variable, I like to use a acronym called MIX, M-I-X, MIX meaning independent, manipulated, which is just another word for our independent variable, manipulated, and then X-axis, X-axis. So with my mix, my independent variable will always be plotted on my x axis, which if I was to draw this out, my x would be my horizontal line and my y is my vertical line. And I like to think of this as knowing it's my y because the tail of the y is vertical, just like our axis. So with mix, with our x axis down here, we will always plot our independent variable on my x-axis. So then the opposite goes for my y. So to help us remember the y, I have the acronym DRY. So this would be dependent, responding, which is another word for our dependent variable, and y-axis. So I know that my dependent variable will always be on my y-axis. So over here, this is my dependent variable. And there are quite a few steps to making a full graph on its own. So this is just one of the steps that we have to remember when creating our line graphs. But a good way I like to remember uh, to always uh, make the perfect line graph is through the use of tails which is another acronym that we can use when making our graphs. The first, the first letter stands for title. So we always wanna make sure we are telling people exactly what our graph is about. If it doesn't have a title, people are gonna be really unsure about what they're looking at. The second letter stands for axes or axes. This is where we get to identify the X and Y axis like we just did. The I stands for interval. Interval means that when we make our graphs, we want a constant spacing between our measurements. And so we'll look at that here in a second. Our L stands for labels. So we not only want to put our axes on the graph, but we want to label them. We want to know exactly what they're showing. So again, this is where our units come into handy, knowing if we are working with grams or milliliters or meters, whatever we're working with, we want to put those units in. And then the last letter stands for scale, which sounds a lot like interval, but it is different. Our scale is the numbers on the line that we're counting by. And so again, we're fixing to do that here in a second, but we don't want to be counting by ones. And then all of a sudden on our graph, start counting by fives that would give us really misleading um, information on our graph. So let's look at an example on how to put our tails into action. So let's say that we are doing an experiment over the outside temperature and the amount of butterflies that I see. So we're gonna label our graph, we're first going to title it, and we could put something like 
number of butterflies butterflies seen in different temperatures in different temperatures so again i want to be kind of descriptive with this i want to tell people exactly what i have been experimenting so this is a very number of butterflies seen in different temperatures is a pretty specific title so then i go to my axes so my x and y axis so let's say that i am measuring again those different temperatures and i'm looking at the number of butterflies so temperature is changing it is that one variable that is changing so that would go then on my x axis so this would be my independent variable it would go on my x axis and again i really want to put something specific down here so i'm going to say that it was measured in degrees celsius that means that on my y axis my number of butterflies that's going to be my dependent this is going to be my dependent variable. So then on my y-axis, I'm going to put number of butterflies. There we go. Perfect. So then we get to the i, the interval of our graph. So let's say, um, you know, I took 10 readings. I can do an interval, make sure my lines are going to be evenly spaced apart. If our lines start getting randomly really close like this, that's not very good because our data is going to look a lot different than if it is perfectly spaced out or at least close enough to each other to where it's not going to be an issue um, and it's not going to make our data look skewed. Uh, L for labels. So we already have done this. We have our temperatures and degrees Celsius, and we have our number of butterflies. So that is good to go. Our last one, scale, is what we're going to be counting by down here. So if I went from 0, 10, 20, 30, 40, and 50, that's a very big difference in temperature. But let's say I counted by 10s in my temperature. I have to count constantly by 10 as I go up. If I went 0, 10, 15, 18, that is not a constant scale. And that's going to make our data look a lot different. It's going to make our graph look skewed. And it might give us a reading that is not um, what it's supposed to be. Same thing with number of butterflies. Um, maybe I start at 100 and then I go 150, 200, 250, 300, and 350. So if at 20 degrees Celsius, I saw 300 butterflies, I would plot that there. So let's do that then. So let's say at zero degrees, I saw zero butterflies. So let's say down here is zero. I would mark zero. At 10 degrees, I saw 150 butterflies. At 20, we saw 300. At 30, we also saw 300. At 40, we saw 100. And at 50, we saw zero. So I could do a rough, uh, a rough connecting of the lines here. So there we go. If we connect the lines, that shows me a trend in the amount of butterflies I've seen within the various temperatures. So again, line graphs are very, very good at showing you these trends, um, especially over time, but also within all the different temperatures that we have. Thanks for watching. If you found this helpful, check out any of my other videos and comment below if you have any questions.